This is Writer Life, a podcast about writing, life, coffee and conversation with Robin John Morgan. Hello and welcome to another episode of Writer Life. As you can see by today's sort of episode title, which is The Right Reason, what I'd like to do because you know, for the last for the last few weeks, we I've kind of strayed into human behaviour and human qualities and things like that. So I, I want to just flip the script a little bit today. And what I want to do is I want to give a very honest look at what a writer's life is really like, because you know I do believe there's there's, there's an awful lot of authors out there who don't really show the truth, and publishing companies in particular today don't really tell the truth. And so I would like to give my honest opinion of, of what if, and, and just highlight a few things, you know, to show the real truth and the nitty gritty behind what it's like to be a writer today in, in what is a very, very difficult environment. I was reading recently that the next great threat to authors is going to come from AI, as there are companies out there who are already working with AI. And to a degree, they're using it in some of the things that they, apps, that they actually publish. Um, some larger companies are actually reported to be looking into ways of using AI to write complete books that can then be published, cutting the author completely out of the loop altogether. And I cannot deny, you know, it is a concern. But if I'm completely honest, it's actually one, uh, it's actually one of an already growing pile that is threatening the livelihoods of writers today. Now I've got a really good friend who he got an AI to write him a story and he decided to send me a copy because he was kind of thrilled with it. I read through it and then I decided I was going to edit it and make some additions and I then sent it back to him and it completely blew his mind away. And the reason for that is that as I discovered the one thing that really hit home for me reading this robotic version was it completely lacked any form of emotional or human qualities. You know, at best, it was very basic, but it lacked connection. And so at the moment, I really do not worry that much. Well, not enough really to concern myself. But saying that, you know, it is something that I'm watching with great interest and following the development especially within the book world. Now, if, if the truth be known, writers have got pretty much enough problems already without throwing AI into the wash, as we have to deal with people in an industry that's hell-bent on exploiting them as creative source, which is writers, people like me, the creative cornerstone of what is, you know, the whole industry and what it's founded upon. And I want to go through things and just lay out a few facts. One of the biggest problems most encountered for writers today is that everybody seems to think that all writers are loaded like J.K. Rowling. I cannot tell you how many times I've, I've just smiled as people have remarked on my so-called wealth because I write books for a living. And that simply is not true. I've worked with new writers who absolutely believe that this new book that they're working on is going to turn around their entire life and they will then, as a result, get fame and a huge fortune because, you know, they wrote a book. I'm a fantasy writer for a living and they do make me laugh because that is complete and utter fantasy. Writing for a living is damn near impossible these days. You know, all of us write for the love and the creation of our stories. Because to be honest, if we didn't and we did write for the income, we would all starve to death and quit. I've come close at times to simply throwing in the towel and then just, you know, writing for myself and never sharing it with anybody else. And currently, you know, I've got to admit, I really am not that far off that once again. Because business, especially big business, has killed 
the book market for writers. The large publishers have betrayed writers in the worst of ways because all that they care about these days is profits. And so when looking for a very fast profit, they throw their weight behind celebrities rather than nurture new writers and help them become household names, which is what they used to do through the 1950s, 60s and 70s. A good few years ago, the larger publishers, of which there were six, cut free all of their mid-list authors and allowed them to become independent because they saw them as less profitable than the well-known celebrities. And so, driven by their finance department, they took on celebrities to write memoirs, cookbooks, and even children's books. They literally let all their lists of writers just go. Some of them they'd paid advances to, and basically they told them, you can keep the advance, just we won't be publishing you anymore. Even then, you know, they're not really publishing a book, they're publishing a name. Because in most cases, the famous celebrity usually, usually uses a ghostwriter to help them write. Because fame may be very rewarding, but writing takes a lot of time. And who has time, you know, when you're that famous? The simple truth is, that if you're famous already, you can very easily get a publishing contract. But if like me at the time, um, when I first started out back in 2006, no one had heard of me, well, my chips were just cut and I had absolutely no hope of getting published. As a result, a lot of companies appeared that started to offer self-publishing services and a lot of writers flocked to them. But sadly, you know, just like the traditional publishers, they were not really that interested in making big writing names. They were more driven by the profits that they could make exploiting writers. With a basic package of around £2,000 to be published, a lot of novice writers paid out and they went through the process, only to find that at every single step of the way, there was yet another fee added. Editing was extra as was promotions or ebook conversions. And the same goes for audiobook versions. If you make a mistake, well then there's a very large cost to correct it. And the list goes on and on. And a lot of writers laid out thousands only to find that at the end of the year, if they were really lucky, they sold around 50 copies of their book. And the royalty per book in many cases was one pound or less. Now, it doesn't take a genius to work out that all that work and you get £50 for the year. It really isn't that much. Now, I've got to say, you know, I'll hold my hand up and admit it, I've experienced this. I laid out far more money than I could afford to publish the first three books in the Heirs to the Kingdom series. I'm not sure how many I actually sold because I've never really got a full report and I've actually never received a single penny in royalties from that particular company, who have appeared now to have completely disappeared from the scene. So I have absolutely no means now of contacting these, these people these days, and any monies that are owed me, you know, I've, I've just come to the point now where I've admitted they're lost forever. I will never get them. Now, having put three books out and you know, I started to have kind of a lot of doubts because I'd been writing Heirs to the Kingdom back to back for quite some while. So in year one, I put out the first book and then in year two, I actually put out the next two books. But things were happening that were really starting to concern me. Now, I will add at this point, I'll put a disclaimer here, and um, part of my termination contract with this company was that I was not allowed to name or discuss the details of my contract of the company that I was involved with. So I really cannot reveal my full reasons for becoming concerned. What I can say is I was really unhappy with the formatting of the prints. One of them had two different types of font 
you know, when I'd have so many chapters one way, and then a random chapter with a completely different font. I complained and I was given the option to make changes, but when I looked at my manuscript that I'd actually handed in, it was very clear to see that this was not actually on me. It was actually the publisher who'd made the changes. To correct the text, I had to pay out another fee, which I argued over, and after an exchange of emails, I was given a discount. But it really made me angry because I was not actually at fault, and I really began to resent how my books were being altered. I'm never going to forget the first time that I saw an ebook version of The Bowman of Loxley, which is the first book in the Ace of the Kingdom series. It was my first ebook. I was really, really excited. And yet when I saw it, it was all out of place and really badly formatted. And it looked more like a manuscript than an actual formatted book. I can remember downloading it, feeling very excited late one night as I sat alone at my desk. And then I saw it and my heart broke. I could not help it as my eyes filled with tears. I was so upset. It made me look unprofessional and like an utter incompetent idiot. I was devastatingly heartbroken, having spent hundreds of pounds to be presented with what I saw as an absolute mess. I think that was the first time I felt I should just give up writing and never publish anything again. And even now, there are some days where I feel the same. In 2012, I had the fourth book ready and I was currently involved with writing the fifth and the publisher was pushing me for it but I held back because I wanted to see if my concerns were right and with no money coming in from any of the books I knew that there was no way I was going to give another book to this company and especially pay them a load more money but the problem with that was that that left me with absolutely no means of continuing as an author Through the last half of 2012 and all of 2013, I spent an absolute age looking into how I actually publish a book. And I embarked on what became a very, very severe crash course in what would be required, what programs I would need and how I'd be able to literally publish my own work and do it my way, exclusively by me. I wrote to the publisher that I had at the time and I cancelled my contract, which was not very well received. But I knew I could not continue and would only feel confident from now on if I went it on my own. I know it sounds crazy, but just knowing that J.R. Tolkien made loads of mistakes in his first book and then spent literally weeks with every first printed copy going through them adding corrections by hand which is what's made actually the early editions very very valuable and it gave me a lot of confidence and i took the stance that if i make a mistake well that's on me and there can be no one else to blame i mean after all the books that i put out through another company made me look like a joke so how much worse could i look I was actually at that point already there. My only consolation was that I was working under the title at Violet Circle Promotions back then, which was a vehicle I used for publicity. And I was using that to advertise and promote my books. So I did to a degree have a bit of an identity online. So it was not completely like starting from scratch because they already had a small following. And that really, really helped. Now, I'm not going to deny, I was absolutely scared to death. Because for me, this was a huge leap of faith. It's just something that I actually had very little knowledge or skill for at the time. So I knuckled down and I read just about every book, every blog. I listened to every podcast, watched all the videos on YouTube that I could in order to do a one-year crash course in the process of publishing a book. And it was not easy, but I was really determined to try. I lived at my desk for a year, putting in around 12 hour days, 
just working things out and trying my hardest to understand everything that I was reading so that I could navigate the landscape of publishing. It's sort of crazy now to look back on it all and understand all of the panic that, <laughs> that drove me and how bloody minded I was because I knew deep down inside I absolutely had to do this. I had to make my books look 10 times more professional than the copies that were currently on sale. Cancelling the contract basically left me in a position where all of those copies, which I hated, were completely removed from all of the sales platforms. And in a sense, it was a bit of a relief. On January the 1st, 2014, I launched Violet Circle Publishing and my small promotional business became an indie publisher. And the first job on the books was a brand new website and a complete revamp of the first three books in the Heirs to the Kingdom series. Now I had a lot to learn. I laid out a couple of thousand quid on brand new programs that I had no understanding of. And everything had to be sort of self-taught to a, po a point where VCP could actually master and, new and use all of the new technology in order to create an actual book. Now I put every penny I had into VCP. My bank account was literally empty when I launched it. It was literally like throwing all of my chips into one pot and taking the biggest gamble of my life. And I won't deny, you know, at the time, I was absolutely scared shitless. I had to focus on the task at hand because, to be honest, if I even thought about the money, I started to panic because I was literally fly flying without a net. If I messed this up, I would lose everything. So this for me was the biggest risk of my life to date. And I was getting too old really to make any mistakes because I also had a wife and I had children who were looking up to me and it was my job to support them. From January until the end of May of 2014, I absolutely worked non-stop. I ran myself into the ground. I sat every day at my desk, working at times all night and going to bed after the kids went to school. I went down every line of everything I had written, but I also put back a lot of things that had been edited out in the very first editions. So the editions that I put together were much better quality books. Now, my books with the other publisher had been over 15 pounds each, and I really wanted to make them cheaper because in my mind, if I could reduce the price, it would give me a much better chance of getting more people to buy them. Now the biggest problem with that was that because I'd gone back to the original manuscripts, you know, and I was going to publish what, what was originally written, the word count was actually much larger than the first editions, and that meant there was going to be more pages in the book, and so therefore the books were actually going to be more expensive to print. Now in my mind, there was really only one way that I could fit more words on a page, and that was to increase the trim size of the book. So basically make the books bigger. The brand new format of the books was taller and wider, which meant less pages, but it gave me more words per page. And so when I formatted the new books, they did stand taller on the shelf, you know, than the first editions. And they did stand about half an inch further out on the shelf from the spines of the other book. But when I actually looked at the actual width of the spines, there was not really a huge amount of difference between my new versions and the old first editions. So I achieved my goal. And because the print cost was lower, because this particular trim size was also cheaper to print, I actually got the price down by two pound at the time. And that was an absolutely huge relief to me. I really wanted the new second editions to be different in every single way. And when I finished, they were. I redesigned the covers, I changed all of the fonts, I formatted the pages completely different, and the size of the books was a huge change. They were much bigger, 
and formatted on a white background with colour digital images, which I did myself rather than use an artist's interpretations as I had with the first editions. I think in a sense I just wanted to remove any idea that these were actually the same as the ones that were published with the other publisher. It's sad in a sense that I felt I had to do this. I've read and spoken with so many authors who felt that joy of being published, you know, and, and getting that very first book. But to be honest, I do feel a little cheated because when I considered the amount of money that I gave to the other company, and then I saw the books that I got, it is a very, very bittersweet feeling because in truth, I absolutely hate those copies. I have my author editions here at home locked away and out of sight. I cannot stand looking at them, knowing that they've been riddled with all sorts of formatting mistakes and they look so unprofessional. Now the new second editions, when they arrived from the printer, they were so much better. You know, I cannot deny, um, they, they were not 100% perfect. Um, there was still a great deal for me to learn. And, and there has been actually a process of updates which has been ongoing, which I now know costs nowhere near as much as the other company had actually charged me. They do look so much better. And they're now formatted the way I'd always dreamed that they would be. I'm not sure that people fully understand what it means to actually be a writer and to actually lift their own book. You know, it's not a vanity thing. It's a great source of pride because the process of creating them is in most cases years of late nights, quiet moments with a pad in thought and the joy of putting the actual stories together. You know, it's a really, really special moment when you sit back and you open your book and you read through it. It's madness, really, because, you know, I, I wrote them and I know the story backwards. And yet, sat quietly reading them in the format of a book, it really is so special. It is that defining moment of your writing life. None of it has got anything to do with money. It is like anything that a creative person does in their own life. Just like a painter who has hung a picture or a carpenter who's finished making a beautiful table. That simple moment of enjoying the fruits of your labor and knowing all of the hard work and the effort and bundles of love that you've committed to your book. And then you finally hold it. It's in your hand. It's so surreal. And words really, you know, they just cannot describe it. Becoming a publisher really opened my eyes to what is seen as a, a noble and creative industry. You know what, if the truth be known, I can state clearly that it's actually one of the most abusive industries I've ever actually been involved with. Writing is a true passion and labor of love. You know, these, these stories you pick up and read, they're like our children. We have slaved over them, sacrificed everything for them. We spent hours isolating and locking ourselves away for years, thinking through each line and giving our all as we stretch our creative limits to the max just to get the story right. You know, it's normal for me to sit down and start writing and hours just disappear. And when I look up, the clock has moved anywhere between 5 and 12 hours. I talk to no one. My eyes are fixed on the screen. My fingers running on the keyboard, of which I've destroyed countless ones in the last 15 years. And I'm, I'm so deeply involved and so drawn into the story. Absolutely nothing else in my life at that moment matters. I skip meals, I lose sleep, I avoid going out, and I sit at my desk, and every day I put something on paper. Some days it is the story that I'm working on, and some days it's new ideas for a completely different story that I add to the folder that is the, you know, it has a host of ideas built up over the years of possible book scenarios. 
I always have more than one book on the go. It's how I dodge writer's block. So if one story is stalled, then what I do is I move on to another and I rediscover my inspiration that way. Now, none of this has got anything to do with money. Writers are far too busy to think about it, to be honest. But once you become a publisher, then you have to take the time to really pay attention. And honestly, it is the worst part of all of it. Because it's at that point, you really see how much you're being screwed over by an industry that is designed to rip off its most dedicated and creative source, the writer. The book market today is ruled and controlled by the dominant giant with the big capital A at the start. They're now so large that they absolutely own the market and control it. And so you get instantly caught in a trap, which is you play by their rules or you sell nothing. The whole industry is rigged. And to be honest, the big publishing houses are really not that much better. The writer is the most screwed aspect of the whole industry, which constantly applies more and more pressure to extract every penny they can from a book, whilst paying the absolute minimum to the author. The first hurdle you have to face is the printers, and ink and paper in recent years have skyrocketed. So it's now far dearer to print a book. We all know how grossly unfair the price of ink is. You know, if you own a printer for your computer, then you will completely understand how at times a printer cartridge refill is actually far more expensive than the actual printer these days. Well, it's, it's no different for a writer uh, who is being held to ransom by an ink industry that exhorts printers for ink because the writer then becomes the, the manufacturer and he has to pay to have the books produced. Now the second biggest hurdle is retailers. When VCP was launched we had to provide a 25% discount on all of the books that go into shops or onto online platforms, the big A being one of them. So if your book is listed at £10 and it's discounted at 30 well that means that they immediately take three pounds of the sales money if the book costs five pounds to print and then you've got the discount which is three and your book is say selling for ten pounds eight of that is instantly swallowed and so the publish as the self-published indie publisher you only get two pounds from the sale and don't forget, you know, if you publish other people, well, you have to pay the author a royalty. And with only two pounds coming in, if they want something like 75p, then the publisher's down to just one pound 25 for every single book that's sold for 10 pounds. It is not much profit for the publisher, but it's even less for the author. The big publishers have a lot more power than small indies like myself, so they can do print runs and they can print out thousands of copies at a time and warehouse them. So obviously, you know, they get huge bulk discounts for printing, which increases their profit margins. Now, knowing you are, you know, publishing a famous celebrity, say, that allows a lot more leverage because you know that the sales are going to come, which is why these days they're not interested at all in new writers and would rather push a famous actor or celebrity chef. All of the advantages help the big publishers stay in profit, but it really is difficult and very hard going for all of us smaller fish in the pool. Writing a book has to be a labor of love. Because if you do not love it, you won't succeed in writing it. And we're not, within all of that, you then still have to deal with other people's perceptions. Now, as I added earlier, as soon as that you announce you are going to be a published author, everybody appears to think that you've suddenly got thousands of pounds per day rolling in. But in most cases today, it is normal for a traditionally published author 
you know, to only receive 50 pence or less per copy sold. Now just think about that. At 50 pence per copy, it takes 10 sales to raise five pounds. And that is your pay for the years of dedication and devotion that you've been freely given in the labor of love that is writing. From a 10 pound sale, the breakdown of the example above is the printer gets five pounds, the retailer makes three pounds, the publisher makes one pound 25, and the author makes 75p. Now, if the retailer decides to sell the book for 14 pounds, they obviously make a lot more profit, but the author still gets paid 75p. It doesn't matter whether the book's £10 or £100, the royalty stays the same. So if you're in it for the money, I would say don't write. You know, become an online bookseller or even a printer. The money is far better. A real writer does not write for the income. And so few readers actually understand that. Because in truth, the only way a writer will ever make a full living out of it is to hope and pray that one day they may just hit that golden moment and have a book hit big. And for a very short space of time, they'll be moved into the top 3% of all authors. Now those are the golden few. People like, you know, J.K. Rowling, Dan Brown, They've made millions, you know. I mean, if you think of J.K. Rowley, you know, her wealth is huge. She became a billionaire. But that's not actually come from book sales. Very few people know that. And yeah, you heard that right. J.K. Rowling is really lucky. She had a big hit with Harry Potter, which I may add took a good few years to really take it off. You know, it's crazy if you actually look back now and, and then realize that Harry Potter, the book, was rejected many, many times before it was finally published. I bet all of those publishers who turned it down in favor of a celebrity have really kicked themselves a few times since those books came out. JK was offered a movie deal for her books and her agents were very, very skilled because what they did was they negotiated a deal that gave her a percentage of all aspects of what became a huge franchise. Most of her wealth comes from that, not from her book sales. Most writers, of which there are a hell of a lot of us, do not even earn the minimum wage. We have other sources of income, and as much as we would all love to spend every waking moment writing, that is not always possible. Being a publisher as well as an author, at first, because I did open my publishing services to other writers, I did not really have a lot of time to actually write. Because then, at that time, I had three other authors who, you know, have now been published by my small Indian print. And most of my time was dedicated to their books. I did have four. But three years ago we parted ways and such was the bitter taste of the ingratitude of this individual and I close VCP to other writers and I no longer take submissions from them. Now VCP only publishes what I put out, which is by me. I spent a lot of time working with these writers before they, they were printed. I work really long hours behind the scenes to prepare their books for them and, and get them at the best that the, they could actually be. And even though I take a lot of time to explain the pros and cons of being a writer to them, which I did back then, you know, I could see that sparkle in their eyes. And, you know, just by listening to some of their big ideas, it was clear to me that they were heading for a fall. You know, with over 2 million self-published books put out every year, the odds of getting a hit are, to say the least, minimal. And yet I see all of these new young writers today filled with these great expectations that are simply far too high. Because in the truth be told, 
If a new, unknown writer sells 50 books in today's market, well, you know what, they've done really, really good for their first attempt. Writing and selling books is bloody hard graft. Or at least the selling is. I mean, I love writing books. It, it is hard, hard long hours, and I do devote my time to them. But selling, I absolutely hate. It is a really, really difficult job. I would say after 35 years of working in horticulture, which was my trade for a very large chunk of my life, book selling is still the hardest I've ever worked. It requires a level of dedication and devotion that goes well beyond any other job, because ultimately everybody is making money off your creativity and leaving you the least amount in the pot. You have to sell far more and keep pushing it so that you're selling more and more and more just to get anywhere near a decent amount of cash. And yeah, it really, really is unfair. The big giants of industry, they exploit that and they expect the writer to make the sacrifices to their income so that the big companies can maintain their healthy margins. And it is completely despicable. But what choice does a writer have when the argument that they make is make the cuts or forget selling on our platform? It is blackmail and there's a gun to your head and you really do have no other choice. 2023 has been a really hard year. We've survived the pandemic, which wiped out book sales as people lost their jobs because their companies went out of business due to lockdowns. And then as we came out of that, everybody ran headlong into the spiraling costs of the cost of living crisis, which really has hit all luxury products very very hard and as much as it actually does make me laugh a book today is now considered to be a luxury it's crazy an iphone is needed it's acceptable but buying a book oh that's a luxury you know it's it's a ridiculous notion but that's how the world is now Slap bang in the middle of all that, recently the book industry has yet again demanded even bigger discounts from publishers. And that has impacted small publishers really hard, because we're already working on the tiniest of margins. Now for me as a writer and also a publisher, I see my business hit hardest. I cannot cut my margins anymore if I want to remain a writer. And just over a month ago, I was faced with a really big dilemma of, you know, is it time to stop writing and completely quit? Or do I do the one thing that I really do not want to do, which is raise the price of my books? Now, to be honest, I see the raising of the price as, as a bit pointless because the discounts are actually work on percentages. So if I put the books up, they get more. And, and the more I give companies like Amazon, which I hate the idea of because they dominate everything and are always demanding more. The result that I get is I've started a process of updating my books because if I don't, I'm bankrupt. You know, when this process now of updating all of the books, because I have to change covers now and remove the prices and put different barcodes on, which, you know, has a cost because I'm going to have to increase the prices and change my covers. Now, not only will that make the books more expensive, it costs me important time away from writing. And I really hate that because all I really want to do is just create more stories. You know, this week I'll see a new book come out on sale. And yeah, you know, the price is now higher. But even doing that will not appease the big giant who will much rather I publish in print with them. And I, I, you know, I, I just won't do that. I don't want to print via that company. My book will appear as being weeks or months before it can be delivered. That's how they put it up. The big giant will start stocking and, you know, so customers, see, they see that. And, and they'll see that, well, you know, you can't have this book for two months. And that will put them off. 
and then that costs me book sales. The giant A wants to control all of it now. That's how big they've got. I mean, they, they, they dominate 80% of the market. And now they want to dominate the publishing market. It's really, really difficult because, you mean, they want me now to publish with them and print with them. And, and they're, they're going to end up the only retailer because as much as the other sites are doing their best, they're struggling. And the pressure that they apply to make that happen, it, it's not easy on writers. We are all slowly being cornered into doing as the big giant says. Now the truth is that my books are now available on worldwide distribution. You can literally buy them on every single platform. But if I go with the big A, as they're trying to pressure me into doing, then I can only sell on their platforms, which takes my book from a very large section of the book world. And I don't want that. But I'm really starting to wonder how long I can actually hold out. You know, I think a time will come where I'll simply stop or just sell from my own publishing website where at least I get to make a little bit more of the profit as I cut out the online re retailers discounts. Now as I said, it is the hardest job I've ever had and if you want to be a writer, you have to give up 100% to the work that you do in writing, otherwise you fail. And it does come with frustrations, you know, because you write it you edit it and trust me you edit it about 200 times you then format it and then you publish it and when all of that is done and you actually have a book then you have to promote it like hell and you never stop no matter what there are no days off you have to deal with all of the bullshit of social media where people will flock to your page hit the like button and then they'll never comment, they'll never like posts, they'll never share them. They just like the idea of having a writer on their friends list. Those few who do, and they are the golden few, they are the most appreciated fans that a writer can get. They have no idea how grateful you are to them because trying to get a book seen is harder than spotting a UFO these days. And the same goes for reviews. You know, people buy the books and they read the books. And out of every 100 people, only one will write a review. Which again is why writers are always so happy and grateful to actually get one. It's seriously hard work. And at times, I find it absolutely soul destroying. I started writing my notes for Heirs to the Kingdom back in 1985 and I finally published the very last book in the series in 2020. That is around 35 years of my life thinking about what became the fantasy adventure series that it has come. I've driven around the country, I've bought books, downloaded and read endless pages of facts spent a small fortune on notepads and pens, computer programs to format and design logos, and I've used up thousands of hours of electricity. And that's all paid for by me, as I lost myself in this crazy fantasy, and I wanted to record it as my crave seemed run wild, and all of my thoughts and emotions and imagination flowed out onto the pages, into what became the book. Now Kingdom for me is very, very special. It represents a huge chunk of my life. But I knew long before I ever published it, I'd never actually be able to recoup the amount of cash it actually cost me to write it. Kingdom was a complete labor of love. It's like my first child, and it really is very dear to me. And it's the reason that I worked so hard to form an indie publishing business because I wanted to finish the task that I started back in the 80s and do the book some justice. I love the story. It took me 14 years sat at my desk writing it back to back to complete it and I'm never ever going to regret that time that I spent creating it. 
Kingdom has touched the lives of some very, very special people who went out and bought it. But it's also enhanced my life tenfold because it was actually through Heirs to the Kingdom that I met the girl who became my wife and my best friend. And she gave me a daughter who we named after two of the characters. A few years back, I sat in my living room as my daughter, who was 11 at the time, sat on the floor facing her mother as both of them talked about the series that, you know, I'd written, and they pulled it apart, divided the layers of the story to reveal more depth, and both of them were giddy and happy and loving sharing that time together, talking through Dad's books. That was the without doubt the best moment of my life there is no amount of money that can buy that i sat silently watching completely blown away and yet smiling like an idiot because it was as clear as day they loved my series as much as i did and for me i mean that was just huge it really was i emptied the contents of my crazy head out onto the paper and those two they brought brought my characters to life as they talked about them as if they were actual real living people that is the reason that i write it's simply that and there's no amount of money that is ever going to beat that if you want to make thousands of pounds and live in the fast lane become an accountant or a stock trader if you want to dream and make the world special for others, become a writer. Just have a second job as well, because you will actually need it. Things need to change so that writers are better rewarded for the work that they do. And yet it does appear like nobody really wants to pay for a book these days. I have friends who look at me like I'm mad and they say things to me like, you know, what? I have to pay for it. It baffles me at times, because these people will happily pay for a mechanic on their car, or a plumber to repair their boiler, you know, or a man to deliver their pizza. But if you ask them to pay for a book, which is how I get paid for my work, and suddenly they're offended. It really is quite ridiculous. But that is the world today. Everybody wants something for nothing. Writers are being totally screwed. So what I ask is, try and remember that the next time you look at a book. You know, if that writer's got a website with sales, use that website rather than the big A. If they have social media pages, like them. If you buy, buy the book online, leave a review. Or go to the social media and write down how much you enjoyed it so that other people can read that. You know, all writers are actually swimming against the tide. So throw them a lifeline and help pull them along a little bit. Because they really do need that level of support if original creative book writing is going to survive. I hope you all enjoyed that and I hope you found it a little bit illuminating and a bit different and maybe you learned something that may help you support other authors out there because there is a lot of us. If you have sat through all of this today, uh, I thank you a great deal for listening in. It really is deeply appreciated. Um, I don't monetize this channel and I've got no intentions of monetizing this channel. So yeah, you know, if there's anything in all of the podcast that I've put up um, anything that catches your interest and you want to buy a book well you know I'm a writer it would be greatly appreciated I'll be back next week with something else something different something interesting and something that will hopefully be informative to everybody or at least make you think if you're an avid book reader then keep turning those pages and keep reading as much as you possibly can we are now a dying breed, as most of the world is much rather watch a movie or play a computer game. Book reading seems to become outdated and old-fashioned, and I would love to see it become trendy again. So if you're a reader, 
share your love and get other people reading books. I will see you all next week and I'll be back with yet another episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Writer Life Podcast. If you have enjoyed this episode, or there are areas of Robin's stories you would like him to discuss, please add your thoughts and questions in the comments, and we will include them in a future episode. You can follow Robin on all his social media links, which you will find listed below, and please, like and subscribe to this channel, so you get the latest notifications when he posts. All Robin's books are available in digital and print formats to purchase or download through all online book sales sites.